Happy New Year! I hope. It's the first day of 2021. Many people, including myself, are grateful to see 2020 in for obvious reasons. To date, over 16 million Americans have been infected with a novel coronavirus, better known as COVID-19. As of today, we are in a race against the clock, as news of vaccine breakthroughs come hand in hand with another surge in rising cases. Terms like wear a mask and six feet apart are now forever in our collective memories. But whatever our differences, we all want to see the same thing, and that is for this pandemic to finally end. Vaccines are a part of everyday life. Up till now, we never really gave them too much thought, right? Unless, of course, it's 1996 and you're a petrified five-year-old with trypanophobia. <laughs> Good times. Now, perhaps more than ever, I think it's really important for us as a community to educate ourselves on the facts about what vaccines actually are. Interested? Then let's talk about it. Welcome to The More You Know, a channel that explores phenomenons in culture, nature, astronomy, and more in the pursuit of knowledge. Let's reveal the official definition of a vaccine. A substance used to stimulate the production of antibodies and provide immunity against one or several diseases prepared from the causative agent of a disease, its products, or a synthetic substitute treated to act as an antigen without inducing the disease. Wow. Now, to better understand the history of vaccines, we kind of have to know what types go with which diseases. And there are a lot of them. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, there are four main types. The first is what you would call live attenuated vaccines. These common vaccines use a weak form of a germ that causes a specific disease. Since they contain a small amount of the weakened live virus, it's recommended that people with weakened immune systems, long-term health problems, or previous organ transplants should talk to their health provider beforehand. Diseases like smallpox, chickenpox, and measles are just a few common ailments that require live attenuated vaccines. Elizabeth I of England caught smallpox in the early years of her reign, which resulted in her now iconic practice of wearing toxic lead makeup to conceal the scars. If only she had access to a live attenuated vaccine. Inactivated vaccines make use of a dead version of a germ that causes a specific disease. Inactivated vaccines, however, aren't likely to provide lasting immunity, and a person can expect to receive multiple boosters of inactivated vaccines during their lifetime. Diseases like hepatitis A, the flu, polio, and rabies all fall into this category. The third type is subunit, recombinant, polysaccharide, and conjugate vaccines. These more intricate vaccines use specific pieces of a germ to ward off a specific disease. Because these vaccines use only desired fragments of said germs, they provide a powerful immune response that targets key parts of the disease. A bonus of this typology is that the vaccine can be used in almost anyone who can benefit from them, including people with weakened immune systems and long-term health problems. Diseases like HPV, shingles, and meningococcal disease fall into this category. The fourth type is toxoid vaccines. Toxoid vaccines tend to use a toxin that's made by the germ that causes a specific disease. They allow the body to achieve immunity to the parts of the germ that cause a disease instead of the germ itself. This means that the immune system response targets the desired toxin instead of the germ as a whole. Like inactivated vaccines, folks may need multiple doses of toxoid vaccines throughout their life. These vaccines cover rarer illnesses, such as diphtheria and tetanus. Interesting, huh? And now that the future is here, vaccine technology actually seems pretty promising with the advent of previously unheard of things like DNA and recombinant vector vaccines. Wait, wait. What if the coronavirus vaccine? We're going to get there. Relax. So now that we understand the basic typologies of vaccines, we can't exactly move forward without discussing who had a really big impact on this field. The origins of modern vaccination can be traced back to English physician Edward Jenner. He sought to reinvent the practice by better understanding the then risky effects of inoculation. 
On May 14, 1796, he would successfully inoculate James Phillips, the eight-year-old son of Edwards Gardner. He collected samples of infected tissue from Sarah Nelms, a local milkmaid who had caught cowpox, a similar yet less aggressive disease to smallpox. Yes, in case you're wondering, she actually caught smallpox from a cow. Named Blossom. Ah. From then on, the word spread, and as the technique evolved over time, more and more people caught on, and we ended up with the vaccine technology that we have today. Now, it's easy for us Westerners to assume that severe diseases hasn't really had a huge impact on us, but in fact, it's had a huge impact on our species and our history. The clean, comfortable, and modern reality that we live in today is not a reality for everybody else, especially not in the past. Take Southern Africa, for example, where in certain developing regions like Botswana, an estimated two-thirds of teenagers will die of AIDS before age 50. These populations don't have access to adequate health care, preventative measures, and vaccines for curable diseases. Now, imagine a time in life where the mortality rate was so high that a vaccine could have potentially saved two-thirds of a population. Insert the plague. The plague, or Black Death as it was called, threatened humanity throughout recorded history and was finally brought under control with the first viable vaccinations and methods of prevention around 1890. This disease, which has three known variations, originated in flea-bitten rodents. The bubonic plague, specifically, swept through European civilizations, most notably during the Middle Ages, from around 1347 to 1352 CE. This was a time when germ theory would not become prevalent until centuries later. Some towns lost an estimated 30 to 50 percent of their local populations, and it's believed the bubonic plague killed an estimated 25 to 30 million people. Symptoms of the bubonic plague include high fever, delirium, and swollen lymph nodes. Once the infection sets in, painful blisters called buboes appeared all over the body. This aggressive bacteria spreads internally at an alarming rate. Once infected, a person could die within days. Medieval doctors would risk their own health by using primitive methods in a futile attempt to potentially cure the sick. One can't help but imagine a reality where the Black Death never happened. So now that we live in a post-plague world for the most part, I always sit back and wonder just how these people persevered in the face of constant sickness death and, frankly, fear of the unknown. While medieval-era sketches and paintings may seem dramatic and over-the-top to us, in reality, <laughs> it probably was just as crazy. Do you ever think about what's going on today and how people of the future will reflect back on our time? Oh, hello there. Oh, I don't buy much. <laughs> just sit right back. And you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. The year was 2020, and life as we knew it had been forever changed. Many believed the feared virus, which spread through our civilization like wildfire, would return us to the Dark Ages. It was a time of great uncertainty and instability. Then, a beacon of hope emerged as news of the first viable vaccination broke headlights around the world. Then you'll never guess what happened next. No, 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 I, I don't want to know what's going to happen next. And there's good reason for that. Something to keep in mind is that, unlike our ancestors, we live in a world full of modern technology, instant information, and the means to protect ourselves against pandemics moving forward. How the future turns out is largely going to be up to us. Science proves that acts like wearing masks, social distancing, and good proper hygiene really does work at flattening the curve of disease. Which brings me to the main point of today's video. The recently approved COVID-19 vaccinations. Insert applause. Now, as of this recording, there is more than one vaccine on the market, but for our purposes, I'm going to focus on the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine, which allegedly has a 95% immunity rate. Let's briefly touch base back on COVID-19. That way we can understand the virus a little bit better and how the new vaccine is going to combat that virus. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus that can infect the upper respiratory system. 
COVID-19 is one of a handful of coronaviruses, hence its scientific name of SARS-CoV-2. This virus spreads mostly through droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes. A great majority of people infected with the virus can experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without requiring special treatment. The elderly and those with underlying medical problems like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, and cancer are more likely to develop serious illnesses. Common symptoms of COVID-19 include fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle aches, loss of taste or smell, sore throat, and congestion. As of December 11, 2020, the Centers for Disease Control approved an emergency use distribution of the recently created Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine for people 16 and over. This vaccine, known as BNT162B2, is a relatively new technology called an RNA vaccine. RNA vaccines give instructions to our cells to make what's called a spike protein. This protein mimics those found on the surface of the COVID-19 virus. Afterwards, our cells break down the protein building instructions leaving only the newly produced protein. This triggers a response inside our immune system which produces antibodies against the protein. With antibodies produced, a person is protected from getting infected if the real virus enters our system. RNA vaccine technology can be developed in a laboratory using readily available materials. This means the process can be greatly scaled up, making vaccine development faster than more traditional methods. The BNT162B2 vaccine will require two doses three weeks apart and must be kept at negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit to preserve the vaccine's delicate molecules. Expected side effects may include swelling at the injection site, fever, fatigue, and headache as the body works to build antibodies. Symptoms like these are common consequences of the vaccination process. The CDC Advisory Group recommends that healthcare workers, residents of long-term care facilities, and anyone that is considered a high-risk group should be the first to receive the vaccine. Supplies are currently limited. The federal government has contracted with FedEx and UPS to transfer the vaccine to vital distribution centers around the country. The sum that each state receives is based on the population. And there, my friends, you have it. All humor aside, I think it's safe to say that we're living in very precarious and distrustful times. I'm just an average consumer, an everyday citizen. It's not my job to persuade or dissuade you from getting a vaccine. I think that what we all need to do is educate ourselves on facts moving forward. Learn about what's going on before you jump to a rash conclusion. The best thing that we can do is educate ourselves on the facts. That way we can make informed decisions on our personal journeys for us and our families moving forward. As long as we will do our part to help flatten the curve and keep the population safe and think of the good of all, we're going to get through this. I'm very curious to know what you guys think. What are you dying to learn more about? Is there something that you think I missed? Perhaps someone that works in this field could shed some more in-depth information for us. If you'd like to learn more about the topics covered today, I have links posted below. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you like these subjects, I invite you to like, share, and subscribe. I do plan on uploading regularly. Remember to stay curious, stay kind, and never stop asking why. And wear your mask. Let's try that again. Emerged. Then. Shit. Shit. Okay. Here we go. Then a beacon emerged. Okay. Then. Alright, I think that's good. I'm tired.